this uh, workshop is part of a project called the Youth Film Challenge. And this is uh, co-produced with the Berkshire Tectonic Community Foundation and uh, the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative and the Civic Life Project, which is my organization. You can have all this information by going to youthfilmchallenge.com. We'll give you all the um, information you need to apply for this, uh, for this challenge. About me, uh, from my accent, you might have uh, understood that I was French. I did a lot of my work for public television, did a lot of work with Bill Moyers, documentaries on artists such as Martha Graham and Tennessee Williams for Mac and Masters. And we did the, uh, a lot of uh, big stories about big topics like love and hate and, and God. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we started the Civic Life Project really to engage uh, young people in filmmaking, but in filmmaking to participate in our democracy. And what we knew and what we discovered is essential to, uh, to share with young filmmakers is that storytelling is crucial um, to do anything, to communicate anything uh, on video. And that is, again, good for documentaries, long form, short form, commercial, political ads, whatever you communicate uh, through digital media, you have to tell a story. Now, I just want to explain a, a little briefly, and uh, you'll forgive my um, talent at the drawing, but what you're looking at is actually a brain. And we need to understand a little bit about how storytelling works on us in order to create films that are going to captivate people, that are going to touch them, and that they're going to watch. So we have, you know, and again, I'm not a neuroscientist and I'm not playing well on TV, but we basically have sort of three essential brains. The first reptilian brain is a basic um, instinct survival uh, brain. So that's the one that um, tells you to flee or fight. It's also the one that regulates your, your breathing, your, all your body function. The next brain is called the limbic brain, and that's the one that regulates your emotions. Uh, the limbic brain doesn't know, doesn't use words, um, but it's very good at um, compiling memories of how you felt about a particular person, a particular uh, event, a particular moment, a particular place. And um, that's what governs a lot of our initial response to the world. And then we have the third, which is the neocortex, and that's the brain that allows you to have higher thinking skills, to, 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 to have speech, to have logic, uh, to do math, uh, anything that really makes us different than any other uh, living creature. Um, however, everything that we apprehend from the world um, goes first to our limbic brain, to emotions. And stories are what creates our fear, our sadness, our happiness, our anger. And if you want someone to pay attention to what you're saying, you're going to have to engage that emotional brain. If you start by giving them statistics that would be of great interest to the neocortex or that the neocortex could help you understand, they're not going to listen to you. So it's very essential that we understand that we have to tell stories in order to uh, engage your audience. And if you want to talk to them about any subject that you want to talk to them about, whether it's uh, climate change or uh, domestic violence or the First Amendment, you have to engage them first emotionally. And the power of stories um, really probably comes from very far in our ancestry. I mean, I can imagine uh, very early on that some, um, some Cro-Magnon type came to say, well, there's this huge animal right outside the cave and it just ate um, Robert. And I guarantee you, you should not go out right now. So there are two things to say about this. First of all, I should really hire, an, uh, hire a good animator. Um, and I'm not sure what, the language or storytelling capabilities of pro people were. But the idea is that the stories probably have played an incredible role in 
our intellectual development as human beings. So as you're thinking about making films, first thing that comes to mind when we're thinking about making a film is big topic. Um, one is worried about climate change or about our democracy. Uh, if you uh, look at the list of topics that we've listed in uh, the information about this challenge, uh, we talk about exclusion um, because of your identity, because of your age, because of your religion. Uh, gun control is an issue. We've been working with students, as I said, for the past 11, 12 years, and gun control has been a, a, a really crucial issue for young people in this country. Um, free elections or you know, how reliable uh, elections are, which has become a big uh, issue. The COVID vaccine uh, mandate, which divides uh, uh, people, and that's a great topic to talk about uh, these days. Many, many topics, bullying and its effect on the LGBT youth is another topic. Um, it's very important before you make a short film or any film uh, that you cannot make a film about a topic. You cannot make even a 60 minute or a nine minute documentary about uh, democracy or um, uh, gun control. Uh, you just don't have time to do justice to the complexity of an issue. And so what's very critical, and that's where we find again our story, is that you want to make a film about a story. I'll give you an example of uh, a film that was made by students, Northwest Connecticut, the Housatonic uh, Valley Regional High School. And they wanted to make a film about First Amendment rights for students. And so they wanted to, to see what, you know, why is it that students don't have uh, a right to First Amendment? So they did some research and they found a, a great story not very far from, uh, from, from them in Connecticut of a young student called Avery Dollinger who got in real trouble um, because she used a word that you should not use about her superintendent um, in, in a personal blog. And so the whole issue was, does the school have the right to uh, punish her because she um, used some language that was not proper, even though she did it uh, from home. A Burlington teenager started the new school year with a free speech controversy hanging over her head. Avery Doniger sued her high school principal and superintendent this summer, saying they violated her constitutional and civil rights by removing her as class secretary after she used derogatory language to describe school administrators in a blog. I was really involved in my uh, student council. I was a part of a, the Jamfest committee, which was to plan this Jamfest event, which was kind of um, a battle of the bands kind of event. Um, about a couple days before the event, we were told that um, just it's not going to happen. And I went home at around 9.30 at night. I wrote on my home blog that I had rightly used. And, um, and the first sentence was, so basically, Jamfest is canceled due to the douchebags in central office. I got a um, call down to the principal's office and to talk to Ms. Niehoff, and she put a copy of my blog in front of me with the word douchebag underlined in red. She goes, okay, well, there's three things you need to do. You need to apologize to the superintendent, tell your mother, and we're going to ask you to step down from all leadership positions. The next one, a film that was done by um, Great Barrington Monument Mountain High School, and this was not very long after the Sandy Hook uh, disaster where uh, I think 22 young children and seven adults were killed in a gun attack on their school. And so the students, when, when we asked them what they wanted to, what film they wanted to do, they said, well, we want to do um, a film about gun control. And again, a film about gun control, the topic is a wide and impossible one to do justice to in a very short documentary. So they did some research and they found that there was a shooting, one of the first in the country, in a school in Great Barrington, a private school, uh, where a young uh, student killed two other students and I think seriously wounded 
um, three adults. And so that became the subject of their film. He was now serving two life sentences in Cedar Junction, a maximum security prison in Massachusetts. Kevin Larkin was the police officer who talked Wayne Lowe into surrendering. I was the only one in the station. The phones were ringing. Um, parents were calling. News organizations were calling. And on top of that, the shooter called me. I said, well, why did you do it? He says, I don't want to talk about it. I said, well, why did you call? And he said, um, because um, I want to give myself up. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. Unless you do exactly what I say, we're going to kill you. We were getting the officers in place. We had one on each corner of the building. And I said to him, now, you have, again, I said, Wayne, I said, you got to do exactly as I said, or we're going to kill you. Plain and simple. You're not going to walk out of this alive. You may take some of us, but we're going to get you. He said, I don't want to hurt anybody else, and I don't want to get hurt. I said, then do exactly as I said. So I said, when you get ready to walk out of the building, walk out of the building with your arms, inter hands interlocked on top of your head. Don't hang up the phone and let the police officer come. As I'm doing that, I got the microphone keyed so the officers can hear what I'm saying so they know what's going on. So he walks out, and all of a sudden I hear, I hear the phone get picked up, and it's my best friend on the police department, well, afterward. He says, hey, Kevin, we got the SOB. He said, I'm going to go have a cigarette now. So that's uh, one example of um, how you use a story as a point of entry to discussing a topic. The rest of the film, in the rest of the film, the students analyze various point of views uh, about gun control and what can be done and what should should be done about the problem that we have in the United States. The final example is an example of a Civic Life Project film that was done by Lawrence University students in Appleton, Wisconsin, about sex trafficking, uh, which turned out to be one of the main issues in Wisconsin. And to the great surprise of um, people living in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is a, a fairly Midwest quiet, um, town uh, realized that it was a big issue in their community. Sex trafficking isn't just a problem that happens in big cities. It affects small communities as well. In Wisconsin alone, Appleton is the third largest city for sex trafficking. With a problem so hidden, how can we stop the victimization of these women? So I met a young woman at my church and the first time I saw her, my heart said, that's a deep well. And I knew that there was more to her than just somebody that was sitting in church. The world that I lived in was um, everybody lived together in one house. There, you had rules that you had to follow. Um, you worked until you got the amount of money that the pimp um, demanded of you. Expectations are to follow the rules. Um, and then to make your quota. So if you have to make $1,000 a day, that's what you had to do and, and any means possible. Um, and then hand that over to him. If you were caught trying to keep the money, that could mean death or a severe beating. Because we're on a main highway and there's lots of hotels here, it's very easy for prostitutes to move from Milwaukee through Fond du Lac, Oshkosh, Appleton, Green Bay, and move back and forth through those cities uh, very actively. When a child uh, leaves their home, if they are on the street, within 48 hours, a pimp will already have them. Why? Because they are on the street, they look needy, they look desperate, and it's not hard to see a child that's on the street that's confused and alone. And a pimp will, uh, immediately go to them. Before I got into this lifestyle, I was living um, in the Fox Cities. Um, I had a pretty broken childhood. Um, I was abandoned at a young age and adopted and then disowned and then in foster care and then I just became a runaway. So um, while on the run, I got into law trouble 
So that just made me run farther. And then I ended up in Milwaukee on the streets and fell prey to people who would benefit from my vulnerability. So that's um, another case where a very personal story introduces a larger issue. How to find a, um, how to find a story? It's actually simpler than one thinks. Um, right before this session, I just went on Google and typed gun control Massachusetts. And you have to do it as in the news uh, category. And what I found was an article in Commonwealth, which I, it's a newspaper that I didn't know, but which talked about our state law, gun laws need some updates. And the fact that um, ghost guns, hoarding and assault weapons need to be addressed. And then comes in uh, examples of how um, gun violence in Connecticut has suddenly gone down and is certainly not as bad as in other areas, but it's still uh, a, a big issue. And so what do you do when you find an article that's like this and you want to do a, a film about, uh, about gun control? Someone wrote the article, in this case is Gary Klein, principal, Jake Klein Consulting, I don't know what that is, but it gives you his email. And the first thing that you do is that you send Mr. Klein an email saying that you're doing a short film about um, a subject that he wrote an article about. And would he be kind enough to grant you a short interview or conversation on the phone where you can ask him, tell him what you're doing and ask him about tips as to how to tell this story. What are the events and elements that are going to make your film an, an interesting film and an important film. It can actually be, you can actually ask pretty broad, someone would say dumb questions, like what are the big issues in Berkshire County these days? And then if you look to, to Google News, you can find an article like this. 62,000 grassroots football matches a year canceled because, because of climate change. So here you have a story, and again, you have Mr. Neil Shaw. It's a very recent article, 18th September, 2021. I haven't read the article, I must confess, but you should read the article if you want to uh, do something about climate change, because that's a story that could bring a uh, very specific focus to your topic. So again, that's, pretty, um, that's a pretty easy way to start finding a story. The other way is to really ask, ask around, ask your parents, ask your peers, ask uh, the person who works at, at, at the supermarket in your area. Tell them we're doing a, a short film about issues that are of concern to our community. And if you had something that you're concerned about, what would that be? What would you do? Ask your neighbors. The first time I met with, with students, uh, they had to register for the course. And so I thought that they had thought already about what kind of film uh, they wanted to make. When I asked them, so what do you want to make a film about? Well, the, the sad thing was that they said, well, I don't know. And so I said, all right, we're in trouble now. Um, I said, well, what is your, what are you passionate about? And then, well, they said, well, well not sure, no. And I said, well, this experience is going to be very short lived because uh, nobody has an idea of what they might want to make a film about. I said, what? Well, okay, what pisses you off? What are the things that really um, annoys the hell out of you? Ah, suddenly they came up with all kinds of ideas. And it went everywhere from the food that was disgusting at the cafeteria to the financing of political campaigns to First Amendment right for the students, or uh, you know, there was a student in their school that had uh, been in trouble because her, her purse had been searched and they found some dope. And so she was arrested and, and got in serious trouble. And they were wondering, they said, well, <coughs> aren't we protected against search and seizure? Isn't that the Fourth Amendment rights? So if you don't have an idea about what to make a film about, try to look uh, in yourself about what really makes you angry and what really you want to talk about to sort of denounce something that is pissing you off. Sorry for the language.
There's one more film that I um, want to show you. It's about the power of stories. This is a study that was made by um, two scientists who um, basically put lots of sensors on people's brains as they were watching films and tried to understand what was happening in, in their brain. I want to tell you a story about a little boy named Ben. Ben is two and a half years old and Ben has brain cancer. And Ben's really happy. He's happy because he's been through two rounds of chemo and radiation and he feels good for once. He doesn't feel yucky and his father's enjoying seeing Ben's happiness. But as the father tells the story of Ben and his cancer, the father's voice begins to break. And he says, you know, it's very difficult to play with Ben because Ben thinks everything is wonderful, but I know something that Ben doesn't, that Ben's dying. And he talks about how difficult it is to play with Ben, knowing that in three or six months, Ben will be dead. And yet Ben is so happy, he's so beautiful. And so the father tries as hard as he can to enjoy Ben, to be joyful around Ben. But then he says in the middle of this short story that it's an amazing thing to know how little time one has left. And as he says that statement, he has merged himself with his son. It's as if the father himself is dying. So in my laboratory, we've studied this story extensively. And what we found is that two primary emotions were elicited. One is distress and the other is empathy. At the same time, when we asked people what they felt after the story was over, we really couldn't get very clear answers. So we began doing other studies on this story. So we took blood before and after, and we found that the brain produced two interesting chemicals. One is called cortisol, which focuses our attention on something important. So cortisol correlated with our sense of distress. So the more distress you felt, the more cortisol you released, and the more you paid attention to that stimulus. The second chemical release is called oxytocin, which is associated with care and connection and empathy. And oxytocin was correlated with people's sense of empathy. And the more oxytocin they released, the more empathic they felt towards Ben and his father. Now, we did something different after this experiment. We gave individuals a chance to share money with a stranger in the lab. And indeed, those who produced both cortisol and oxytocin were more likely to donate money generously to a stranger they couldn't see in the lab. In another experiment, we gave individuals a chance to donate money to a charity that works with children who are ill. And indeed, those who released oxytocin and cortisol donated money to this charity. And in fact, the amount of oxytocin release predicted in both cases how much money people would share with a stranger or with charity. What we're seeing is that this narrative is changing behavior by changing our brain chemistry. So we decided to go a little further and ask, could we actually predict before they watch the video who would donate money to charity? So with funding from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, we reran the study in which we not only took blood, but now we measured heart rate and skin conductance and respiration. And using these additional measures, we were able to identify this distress response and this empathic response, and we could predict with 80% accuracy who would donate money to charity. These individuals get paid about $20 to be an experiment, and the people who donated money on average donated half their earnings. So we began to investigate this story further. We used functional brain imaging to identify the regions in the brain that were most active while watching that video compared to a control video in which Ben and his father were at the zoo. And what we found was that the most active areas for the emotional story were areas in the brain associated with theory of mind or understanding of what others are doing and areas that are rich in oxytocin receptors that make us feel empathy. And guess what happens when you watch 100 seconds of a father and son at the zoo? Nothing happens and people just blank out. There's no reason for them to attend to this information because nothing's happening. There's nothing exciting. It's important to understand that stories have to have this particular structure. 150 years ago, a German theorist named Freytag called this the dramatic arc. So there are particular story aspects that go into making an effective story, exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and then this denouement. The story of Ben and his father talking about knowing his son is dying has those aspects. It captures their attention. There's a coming climax. How can Ben's father actually engage with his son in this wonderful, relaxed, playful way, yet knowing 
that his son will die soon. It seems like there may be a universal kind of story structure. So stories are powerful because they transport us into other people's worlds, but in doing that, they change the way our brains work and potentially change our brain chemistry. And that's what it means to be a social creature. So that um, concludes today's presentation. I hope that you um, have enjoyed your time and I'm looking forward to seeing you on another one of those. Those are recorded. They will be on the usefilmchallenge.com webpage and we will offer um, other uh, workshops as well. If you have any questions about how to submit a film or anything that you want to know or any help that you want to seek, please uh, feel free to uh, connect with us. Thank you so much.